Okay, so um, I think I'm going to get started. It is 11.20. We still have some people joining us. Um, I'd like to ask that if you have noise-making devices, and I'm pretty confident that all of you do, um, if you could mute them, that would be ideal. Um, just because otherwise I might lose my train of thought, and that would be a bummer. Um, so my name is Janet Ebsen. I am uh, a, the community manager for congregate.com. Uh, I am here because of a really strange and interesting life. I started out as a social worker. I did... Uh, I worked with adolescents with severe emotional and behavioral disturbances. And then after a while, I felt a little bit burned out about that, uh, significantly because I hated talking on the telephone, which I've later discovered is common uh, in our world. But at the time, people thought it was a little flaky. So I moved into, oh, nonprofit management and other things and ended up at Congregate a few years ago. And it's really um, unexpected to me all the ways in which my various sort of wayfinding jobs have all sort of coalesced to make this, to prepare me for what I do now, which I love. Um, so in addition to that, um, there's so something you need to know about me, and that's that I'm a storyteller. If you ask me a question, I will probably respond with a story, and the story has a, a purpose. I come from sturdy peasant stock, and one of the values that I got from them is telling stories. It's a way that we remember the people who came before us. It's a way that we learn from their experiences. And it's a way that we process and understand the world around us. So today, I'm going to be telling you some stories. Um, I'm telling you those stories for reasons. I'm hoping that, well, I'm confident that in a week or a month, you won't remember my outline. But I'm hoping that when you need them, my stories will come back to you and they will teach you what you need to know at that time. So let's get started. It would be good if I could advance. There we go. So my first story is about this lady. Um, she is the CEO uh, of Congregate, where I work. Um, more to the point, for this story, she's an aunt and she's a knitter. Emily's niece, Molly, is now seven. The picture's a little old, but it's such a cute picture. Um, Molly asked Emily to make her a skirt, a knitted skirt. And those of you who have done any knitting know that this didn't happen overnight. But eventually, sure enough, there was a knitted skirt. Um, but the problem was that it was a little big. It didn't quite fit. Molly slimmed through the hips, as many very young children are, and it just wasn't quite staying up. So Emily had a problem. Um, and she didn't have a blueprint. She didn't have a pattern. What she did have was a crochet hook, an idea, and a willingness to try possible solutions. So she figured out how to knit uh, belt loops, and she added a black ribbon belt to the skirt. And so the net result was that this skirt is dramatically cuter than it would have been without the belt. As soon as I saw this picture on Facebook, I went, oh my god, that's it. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing that can come out of a crisis. Um, so what I'm hoping to tell you all about is ways in which you can find your communities are in crisis, things are going wrong, and you're not going to know what to do. But figure out what you can do, think creatively, move forward, and hopefully you're going to end up with something that's better than it would have been if you had never had the crisis at all. So a little bit about Congregate. Um, Eric, where are you? <laughs> I put the, I chose this screenshot before I knew Eric was going to be here. That's his game, Crusaders of the Lost Idols. Um, but anyway, um, we have over 100,000 games. It's a gaming platform. Um, any developer can upload their game to our site. Um, they get, in exchange for that, they can have uh, player feedback, and they get a portion of the advertising revenue that's earned by their game page. Uh, if they have purchases in their game, they can integrate our virtual goods API and um, earn some additional money that way. Uh, we usually have about 300 to 400 virtual goods games on the site at any one time. A couple hundred forums, um, lots of different kinds of chat rooms. It's, there's a lot going on. So <clears throat> 
Within a month or so of my becoming community manager, Congregate had one of the biggest community crises in our history. So that was great timing. Uh, In the process of trying to manage that crisis, we made a lot of mistakes. Quite a few of those mistakes made things a lot worse instead of better. (laughs) And so when we did our post-mortem at the end of about two weeks, here was how it started. (laughs) 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 And the lady who wrote that is sitting here too. Um, But the point is that not everything we did made things worse. And so we paid attention to what made things worse, and we talked with each other, and we kept doing more of the things that didn't make it worse. And so it was expensive, and it took a lot of time. It took a lot of work over those couple weeks. But by the end of it, we had actually figured out the basis of how we handle all our community crises from now on. Ever since then... The things that we learned in that crisis have been what we do. Um, And we also made a lot of really great relationships with players, um, and a lot of those folks are still playing on our site. Um, I get messages from them sometimes. Hey, can you take a look at this game? It's given me some trouble. I really appreciate that thing you did four years ago. And I'm like, sure, I'll take a look. That's great. Um, So I never would have thought it at the time, but uh, in retrospect, I do believe that... The effort and the financial costs were entirely worthwhile. Um, we absolutely got, um, we, 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 it was worth the cost, is what I'm saying. And since then, I have had front row seats as many different developers have had many different kinds of crises with their communities. Um, on a day-to-day basis on Congregate, the developers and their community managers handle the crises that come up. So, But for something to escalate up to the point where it comes to my attention usually means that everything is really hitting the fan and nobody has any idea what to do. Um, but the thing is that all community crises fundamentally come down to one issue, and that's loss of trust. For some reason... In some way, players are disappointed. (laughs) I had a lot of fun Googling disappointed cute animals (laughs) for this slide. (laughs) Um, Something did not go as expected. They could be there was a bug in the game. It could be um, that you didn't meet a launch date. Um, Maybe it was that they went looking for some support and couldn't find any. It could also be that they had unrealistic expectations, but for whatever reason, they don't trust you to make things right. So to resolve your crisis, you need to rebuild trust and the confidence in you and how you're going to handle problems in the future. And this is possible. Um, And more to the point, uh, it's also possible that after you've done that, your community will know you better, they'll trust you more, and you'll have a better rapport than you would have otherwise. So, <clears throat> there is exactly one tool that all of us bring to every situation that we're in, and it's ourselves. In social work, this is called use of self, the understanding that the persona that we, bring, we present will have an effect on whatever situation uh, we find ourselves in. And so this means that you're a tool. <laughs> and I have pretty much the best job ever. <laughs> No, but persona, you are uh, a tool. And how how people see you is what determines how they respond to you. You'll be most effective in both preventing and managing crises if you're able to convey that you are intelligent, principled, and fair. When I'm interacting with uh, frustrated players, I'm sympathetic, but I'm also competent and in charge. My underlying message is, I care about your happiness, and I am here to fix this. Now... Competent, principled, and fair is not at all the same thing as, I know exactly what we are going to do, and we'll have this done by EOD. Uh -uh. Sometimes you'll know from the beginning what you're going to do. Other times you're going to sort of have to dive in there with your metaphorical crochet hook and figure out how to make some belt loops. But the most important tool you'll have at your disposal is not a crochet hook, but yourself. Like any tool, you need to know what you can and cannot do. This Swiss Army knife has a lot of great features. But if you want it to fry an egg, you're going to be sorely disappointed. 
although I have spent some time thinking about how I would make a frying pan (laughs) using those tools, but that's beside the point. Um, Similarly, you need to be able to accurately assess what you can and cannot bring to community crises. Don't try to to project a strength you don't have, or it will damage your credibility, because they're going to see through you. I am not the most tech-savvy person who works at Congregate. In fact, I might be the least tech-savvy person who works at Congregate. So when I dive into a crisis, (laughs) there's a lot of, okay, so tell me what that means. (laughs) Um, But because I don't pretend to be anything other than who I am, uh, players find that disarming instead of accusation-worthy. And so owning who you are is going to be a great strength to you in the long run. Sometimes not easy, but it really is worth that journey. Now, jumping back to the first story, when I was talking about the skirt that Emily made, I feel the need to point out that she already knew how to knit when she started that skirt, didn't she? She had the core competencies that she needed to finish that project. And I'm sorry to say that not every community manager I meet is great at interacting with players. I'm sure that you all are amazing, but for the sake of thoroughness, I feel like I just need to touch on a couple of basics. Um, One of the things that Congregate does is that we choose and train members of our community to be volunteer chat moderators. And when we train those people, we don't start out by telling them how the banning and silencing tools work. We don't start with punishment at all. Uh, What we do is we start with teaching them the tools that they need to manage the community, the chat room, and and particular conversations without needing to resort to punitive measures, right? Um, And I believe that community management is the same way, that if you develop a certain kind of relationship with people, they are going to be more likely to go in the direction that you are trying to herd them, even though they are fundamentally cats. So... Here is the big secret. If people like and respect you, they will trust you, and they will do what you want. It seems really obvious, doesn't it? And yet it's very common for people to overlook that, I would say. So this may come as a surprise, but Internet folks are not a big fan of authority figures. (laughs) We (laughs) are... Somebody's gesticulating at me like, what? (laughs) Um, We all go through a life phase called individuation. Uh, Typically when we're adolescents, but not always. Um, Where where we separate from our parents. We start to question the things that they're telling us. We, um, and and indeed, we begin to challenge why they have authority at all, right? Like, why is why do I have to listen to you? Let's explore that. And, um, I think a lot of players sort of present as though they are stuck in that phase. Some of them actually are still adolescents, and so that's life appropriate. Um, but regardless, I think there's a culture on the internet that says respect needs to be earned. It's not just granted to you automatically. So, in the face of this skepticism, how are you going to go about earning respect and trust? So uh, the first thing is to be lenient. If you address only the most important things, people are more likely to listen. Say you have two problems. On this hand, you have people who are posting in your forum in text speak, and it's annoying some of your players. Over here, you have people who are telling other people to kill themselves. Now, I hope that you're going to recognize that this is a much more important problem. And so if you don't yammer about this, but focus on this, people are going to pay attention, right? And so you want to appear reasonable to most people, and you want to focus on the things that actually matter. (laughs) I'm seeing a couple of people laugh. I love this slide. When I was redoing our moderator training a few years back, I googled images fairness, and this is what I got. (laughs) Be fair like the fairness frog, because the fairness frog is totally a thing. We've all heard of the fairness frog. (laughs) And the randomness of that really appealed to me. In fact, some of our moderators got together and bought me a frog squishable and sent it to me. so be fair, like the fairness frog. But in a seriously, uh, seriously, par- players will detect if you're biased, if you tend to be more lenient with people who are your friends, if you tend to be harsher to people who just annoy the 
piss out of you, they'll notice. And they will go, hmm, mm-hmm, this person is not really all that. Because they're biased. The other thing that goes along with that is that you need to always be thinking about what's best for the community as a whole. You can't please every individual. Somebody's going to be pissed. But... Um, Reasonable people will be able to look at your decisions and go, okay, so so and so is annoyed, but she's clearly thinking about what's best for everybody. I'm going to give her a pass. So be lenient, or sorry, be nice rather, but not a pushover. So if you're nice to people, um, they will be more likely to be nice to you. And also, if you are nice and calm, it makes it pretty much impossible to troll you. I could tell you stories, but then I'd run over. So, um, the other thing to keep in mind is that people will live up or down to your expectations. This sounds like something that is just sort of happy, clappy, community manager nonsense, but it's like a real thing. Like there's psychological research about how people subtly communicate expectations to each other and how people will, um, try it either to elevate themselves or debase themselves to meet those expectations. So if you treat people like they're punk kids, they'll probably act like punk kids. But if you treat them like they're uh, human beings who are capable of coolness, they'll try. Like even if they are punk kids and they don't really know what that looks like, they're going to try. <laughs> so um, the last thing is to be transparent. As an authority figure, uh, players are going to want to know what the limits of your authority are and how you use it. And if you're willing to talk to them frankly about what you do and why, um, they'll know that you are operating within the bounds of, if not law, then a structure, right? You're not, they're not going to get banned from the game just because you had a fight with your significant other or because it's raining and you hate the rain. <laughs> that they're not subject to whims, they're, there's, that there's a structure for the authority and that's going to be reassuring to them. So finally, remember the silent majority. If you seem fair and reasonable, uh, people will believe in you for the most part, even though some noisy complainers might not. So having covered the basics, let's talk a little bit about how to manage a crisis. Let's say you're flung into a crisis. What do you do? So um, the first thing is to try to understand the issues thoroughly. When you first become aware of that people, everybody is upset and the forums are on fire, you won't know precisely why that is. And you'll get bits and pieces of the story, but you need to make sure that you have asked enough questions until you understand the whole story. For instance, problem is the game is down. Okay, that's a problem. But sometimes it's really that the game is down and we're missing an event. Sometimes it's that the game is down and we wrote to support and told them about it and they said, oh no, the game is just fine. <laughs> so in the second two scenarios, you have an additional problem that you need to think about before this whole thing is going to be wrapped up. Just getting the game back online won't really solve it if people are still going to be mad about the time they missed in the event or mad that support blew them off. So make sure you understand the whole problem. Remember to apologize or express regret. Um, this is something that's really easy to forget because of course we're all thinking, you know that I didn't do this on purpose. Um, but players uh, won't necessarily take that for granted. They're human and human beings want to have their distress acknowledged by other humans. Um, and expressing regret or empathy is a way that we do that for each other, right? So, for instance, if somebody's grandmother dies, you say, I'm really sorry to hear that. Now, you're not saying, you're right, I killed your grandmother, and I'm super sorry for doing that. <laughs> no, you're saying, I'm sorry that you're experiencing regret and loss and pain. <laughs> so the same goes for communities. Um, these sorts of statements that are up here will let people know that they have been heard and that you sympathize. Um, and, of course, if you had a, a part in creating the problem or making it worse you should take it a step farther and actually apologize for that as well. So this is another one of those things that seems really obvious and yet in the moment is going to be easy to forget. Explain your ne next steps. 
Um, remember, you're in a situation where people are not feeling very trusting of you. They have concerns about whether or not you're going to do a good job. So the best way to start getting them back on track is, or to getting trust rebuilt, I should say, is to tell them what you're going to do. Um, otherwise, they're going to be like, oh, so she, she's going to go down and kick the servers, right? No. <laughs> But I can call the people who can, uh, you know, reboot the whatever it is. See, that's my tech knowledge right there. Uh, <laughs> um, so make sure that their expectations are ones that you can actually meet. Um, and then, <laughs> this is also important, uh, do it. Don't just say it and then be like, yeah, well, I'll get to it. Do it. Um, and report back. Don't... Uh, just because you've said you'll do something and you know that you're a person of integrity, so of course you've done it. Um, but the players are in a situation where they're not feeling very trusting. And so they're not going to go like, oh, well, she said she would do it, so I guess she did. No, they're going to be like, well, who knows? So just go back, hey, I did that thing. Is it better? How's everybody feeling? Um, and so you want to keep iterating that until... People are reporting that they feel better, that they think the situation is improved. Not, not everybody is going to be happy. But if most people feel like you have done everything you can, then that's what you can do. Uh, a, a, a last note that I had originally left out of my outline, but my manager pointed out to me that it was important. <laughs> Because I took it for granted. See, this is how crises go. These things are so obvious that we take them for granted. Uh, do better next time. Uh, the first time you make a mistake, or your team makes a mistake, your community will forgive you, assuming you, you know, make it right. Long about the fifth time you make the same mistake, it won't matter what you say or what kind of compensation you give. They're not going to trust you again. Um, so, you know, I had that slide about the postmortem. Be sure to have one of those and have it be an actual meeting, not just a couple of conversations in the hallway. Take notes. Come up with a plan for how you're going to change your flow in the future so that these things don't happen again. So this is not the most beautiful slide in my presentation. But anyway, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's better than a pound of cure. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about some pitfalls. Um, I've talked about how to handle the crises that you find yourself in. But it's even better if you can steer your community between the pitfalls so that you don't end up in a hole in the first place, right? Um, and these two are based in some people that I've seen end up in holes. <laughs> I'll tell you a bit about how they handled them, but also hopefully give you some pointers on how to avoid them in the future. So first I'd like to talk about the moderate path, which ties back to some of the things um, that I was touching on earlier with fairness and lenience. So a couple years ago now, I got pulled into a situation in a game forum. A user who I will call Bob not his real name, as far as I know, had played the game <laughs> for quite a while, and then he quit. Uh, but despite having quit, he returned every day to be disruptive. He would insult the other players, he would talk trash about the game, and he particularly liked to insult and bait the community manager, who I'll call Amy. <laughs> um, and as I read through the forum post that Bob had made, I began to notice some things. So to begin with, he was a player who had spent a fair amount of money in the game and had some trouble getting support. This guy was a bit of a hothead, and so he grouched about his bad experience in the forums. So far, all pretty understandable and normal. Well, here's where things went awry. Instead of expressing concern about Bob's bad experiences, Amy just removed his posts. Bob responded with angry criticism, and she got angry in return, and they got locked in this power struggle, right? Now, Bob was behaving badly, and Amy, despite her best intentions, was just feeding that troll every day. She would hide his post. She'd talk about how terrible he was. She was personalizing it way too much. Okay, so clearly, she didn't mean to get into this situation. I know she didn't, but she was in an unfortunate situation where she had overreacted initially and then not really been able to backpedal. 
So the way to avoid that is to be to allow negative feedback within reason. So the things underneath the heart are the things that I would allow and encourage on our site. The things underneath the other, the circle slash, are the things that I would hide. And depending on how routinely the person had been posting stuff like that, I might take a little bit of action on their account to be like, hey, I meant it when I said stop saying that. <laughs> um, none of those are actual posts. Uh, those are actually examples that I made up because I have an amazing job. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so back to Bob and Amy. Um, in one of Bob's forum posts, he had asked why this particular game was still on Congregate, despite its many flaws, which he described colorfully. Um, underneath the snarky comments, though, was a legitimate question about Congregate's policy and approach. You know, how do we let, why do we let games stay on the site? What are our boundaries? and so on and so forth. So that question was my opening because that's right in my wheelhouse. So I chimed in and I'm, I'm tricky rodent. And I answered his question seriously. He asked some follow-up questions and so did a couple of other players and I answered those seriously as well. But I gave him, along with the information, a sense of myself as unruffled and competent. Um, he at some point made a passing comment that he says, I don't really give a lot of flowers with my post, but I'm not lying. I'm not making stuff up. I said, that's okay. I don't expect a lot of flowers. And I could tell that there was real stuff here. So, you know, this was apparently quite disarming to him. So this is one of my favorite forum posts of all time. He, he goes through a good bit of effort trying to get himself to say something nice, and he finally manages it. And then he has, says he has to go lie down because it was so much work. <laughs> <laughs> and then, now, one of the other players responded before I could, and this was something that made me even more happy, because suddenly they see him in a different way than they have seen him before. Until now, they all hated his guts. And they're like, oh, you, you can be funny, and even kind of nice and reasonable. <laughs> and to which, of course, he was, oh, you can't prove it. But... Um, from then on, things really changed for him and for that forum. And he and I had a little sort of private side conversations, and he agreed to leave the forum alone and go off and play his own game. And in fact, he is still on our site, um, and he's still playing an assortment of games. He occasionally has a kind of a feisty forum post, but nothing like it was before. <laughs> so it is possible to sort of win people over and have them become more productive members of your community instead of destructive ones. And the thing that I want to highlight, too, is that handling negative feedback calmly and without defensiveness makes everyone respect you more. If someone is trying to upset you, the solution is to get as unupset as you can. It makes you in charge of the situation and not them. Beyond that, um, if someone has negative feedback, consider what they have to say. Even if they're being a jerk, they might have some good insights. Uh, one of the most important lessons I ever learned about moderation was back when I was a volunteer chat moderator. We had a truly awful user, and he made a point to me one day, and I went, oh. And what he said basically formed the entire basis of a bunch of the stuff I've talked to you about and was this huge gift to my future professional career. But it came in this like poop and insult covered wrapper that if I had <laughs> thrown it away, <laughs> I would never have realized that there was really a, a, a kernel of really good information there. So I'm glad I didn't do that. And I encourage you to do the same. Uh, sometimes even jerks have good points. And so... Um, and similarly, like, of course you're going to feel defensive, right? Like, I know that we can't hear people say terrible things about us and not feel a smidgen of defensiveness. Well, okay, most of us can't. But you don't have to let on that you're feeling that way, right? So just sort of move that emotion into a separate place and be like, oh, okay, I'm sorry to hear you feel that way. Let's talk about that. And suddenly the situation is going to diffuse. Now, 
So this is the moderate path, right? Which means that it's possible to err on one side and it's possible to err on the other side as well. So you want to listen to players, but it's also possible to listen too much or to be too responsive when you listen. It's less common, but it still happens. Um, in my experience, it's usually when a game dev is just starting out. Maybe their team is very small. Um, so every time they make a change or a tweak, then they go and they listen in the forums. What do you guys think? Did you love it? Uh, <laughs> oh, you didn't love it? Oh, what could I do that would make you love it? Um, and so sometimes then the developers will go and make big changes to the game based on the feedback they got, which seems amazing, right? It seems egalitarian, and it seems um, very collaborative, and all these really things that feel really good. But there is a downside to this, um, which is that um, sooner or later, players are going to develop um, a sense of entitlement. They're going to feel entitled to that level of attention. So then the question becomes, what happens when the developer is a success? And when they inevitably, as they must do, start to make a new game and start shifting their attention somewhere else. What happens, in my experience, is that the players can get really toxic. Um, and they can get really angry and embittered by the loss of attention. Um, this next slide is one I forgot to remove, so boop, boop. <laughs> so uh, the moderate path is listen to what players have to say, but don't always act. Um, allow disagreement and criticism, but require that it be constructive. So you want to address concerns, but try to avoid taking them personally. And you're going to want to diffuse emotion by remaining calm. So Alison Huffman <laughs> is right here, and she did not know this was going to be one of my slides. Now... <laughs> When Allison was, and she's taking a picture to send to her mom, that makes me happy. So um, when Allison was growing up, her mom would always say, honey, you know, different people are different. And she was finally like, mom, I got it, different people are different. But then you go out into the world and you meet people who are way different, like way different. And you're like, whoa, different people are really, really different. <laughs> And it's true. Um, different people are really different. Um, and gaming is global. And that means that we are or will be managing global multicultural communities. Uh, as part of that, we'll need to manage purchases and related issues for folks all over the world. I was surprised a few years back to learn that different cultures have very different norms about things like business and consumer protection. Players are a part of a global community, but they're going to approach purchasing and expectations um, through, the culture, through, through the culture in which they grew up. Right? In the, in, they're going to expect what they believe to be true about all purchases, of course, except it's not true worldwide. And differing expectations uh, lead to broken trust, right? Because one side is going to be acting in the way that they think is totally normal and reasonable and expected, of course, this is just how you act. And then another side is going to be horrified that they've said they've wanted to do this. And then the first side is going to go, what? What's so horrifying about that? And, you know, whew. so I am not an expert on cultural differences, but I wanted to share a couple of observations. And if this is something that um, seems really meaningful to you, you can um, carry on on your own, obviously. Um, Here's what I've seen. Players in the EU are accustomed to strong consumer protection laws. Uh, they expect a lot of transparency, and they take it for granted that there will be strong consequences, and in particular, strong external consequences from some kind of authority figure if um, a game doesn't handle things in a way that they think is appropriate. Uh, in my experience, uh, Southeast Asian, and particularly uh, Chinese culture, is almost opposite. Um, as I understand it, uh, folks from that culture, uh, both businesses and consumers, walk into a transaction with the um, expectation that they are both there to maximize their uh, benefit from that particular transaction. That's not my culture, but there is a sort of a brisk efficiency to that, that that I have to say I kind of admire. Um, Americans are more or less in the middle. 
Um, we're accustomed to some consumer protections, but not as many as folks in the EU. We expect merchants and customers to be self-interested, but we also have uh, a belief that self-interest can in include um, uh, the development of a long-term relationship that's going to be mutually beneficial. Um, and so, and we're, we feel sort of insulted when someone else doesn't have that same relationship goal in mind. So if the root issue of a crisis is cultural, realizing right away that the issue is cultural means that we can identify that all parties are acting in good faith and begin to rebuild trust and come up with some new sort of mutual expectations about what we think is reasonable. Okay, so now the next way I have seen uh, communities fall into holes of conflict and crisis is um, when they have problems with their support. So support really isn't optional. <laughs> um, remember what I, <laughs> what I remember about, so crises are caused by loss of trust, but I have noticed something, which is that the real crisis often starts when support is uh, not up to the challenge. Um, the vast majority of our players are reasonable people. Yes, there are some who think that your game is worse than Hitler, the worst in human hi history, and so on and so forth. But they are noisy, but not really all that numerous underneath it all. Um, most players are actually regular folks who know that the world is flawed, that all code has bugs, that sooner or later every game, if it's deep enough uh, and long-lasting enough, is going to have glitches or unintentional loopholes to it. So they don't expect your product to be perfect. What they do expect is that when they experience a problem and reach out to customer support, they'll get prompt, competent, and helpful responses. If they have a problem but can't get the support they need, that is when you start to lose trust. It seems like it should be easy, but it's not. Running uh, customer support is hard. You need people who can understand poorly written complaints, who are... <laughs> Somebody I know who works support is laughing hard. <laughs> um, you need to be, you need to understand technical issues. You need to know the game backwards and forwards. So it's not easy to assemble a team of people who are good at this, uh, but it's really, really important. So you may have a really small team and you may feel like we're too small to offer customer support. Nope. Nope, nope. <laughs> um, every game has to have support. Players talk to each other, and if one person, well, I just bonked my microphone, sorry. If one person tries to get support and fails, they'll tell the others, hey, this game is fun and all, but don't spend any money in it because they won't help you if you have a problem. So you don't want that. I'd encourage you to put a button in your game that spawns a light box, at least give them an email address where they can send in their problems. And then after they've sent in those problems, somebody has to answer them. <laughs> um, you need to, uh, it doesn't have to be a super in-depth response. A lot of people will write in, I love your game, here are 25 suggestions to make it even more awesome. You don't have to respond to every single one of them, you can just go, hey, thank you so much, I'm so glad that you love the game takes just a minute. Um, if somebody has a bug, try to reproduce it. Uh, most especially if somebody has a problem with purchasing, you're going to want to try and address that and address it promptly. As I said, I know that in small teams it's so difficult. Um, you're trying to balance bug fixing, new content, all kinds of things, but this really is important. Um, choose someone to answer support tickets, put it in their job description, Set an internal expectation. Maybe you'll answer within two, three business days. Please, less than a week. <laughs> um, but if you dis realize really deep down that this is important, you'll, you'll find a way to make it important. So the, another problem that happens is sometimes games have sudden and explosive success. I remember a few years back, I was working with a team I'll call Apple Tree Studios. Their game had an explosive success. And to say that their support system was overwhelmed would be like saying the Pacific Ocean was a little bit damp. I mean, they were just swamped for months. 
Um, obviously, there's no way of knowing how much money they left on the table when they, with their support issues, but I would guess, based on how profitable the game overall was, that it was probably millions of dollars. In retrospect, I bet they wish that they had chosen a ticketing system ahead of time and that they, one that could scale from small to large in a very rapid and easy way. And I bet that they wish that they had had an engineer spend a week or two integrating the support system with the game so that the game would pass through basic player information. What's your name? What server are you on? You know, a little bit of information about the player and it would just make it would have made their customer service so much more efficient and um, just so much more uh, effective, really, from the beginning. And they would have been so much more prepared for success. So you also need to have a plan for VIPs. Um, if you're in an industry as the free-to-play gaming world is, where the vast majority of re your revenue comes from a relatively small number of people you need to make sure that those people get top-notch support every time. Now, I have heard of some games where they purposely don't allow the customer service reps to know anything about a player's spending history. And I really admire that. I think that is, speaks a lot of volumes about their desire to make sure everybody has a top quality experience. At the same time, I'm a pragmatist. And... Um, if, unless you're at this wonderful point where you are confident that you can give everybody top-notch service every time, it's worth your while to figure out a way to winnow out the VIPs and give them a little something extra. Uh, one thing Congregate has done is to identify a particular staffer. Uh, his name is, <laughs> he just started looking around. His name is Nikhil. He's right there. Um, he's our go-to person for VIP support and their frustrations. So if a VIP writes into support, then Nikhil takes it and responds to them directly. Um, the next time they have a problem, they usually contact him directly because he's their guy at Congregate. Um, and bear in mind, our support is excellent, but the personal touch of having somebody that you know and you can just go to is really valuable. Um, another thing that I've seen done is I worked with one company where their VIP support approach was that they refused to use canned messages. Um, which I thought was just really, for their VIPs specifically, which I thought was just so interesting. And it took me a while to see the beauty of it. But, I mean, at first I was like, oh, well, I guess if, so if two VIPs write in with the exact same problem, they won't get the exact same answer, which is nice. I mean, they'll, you know, if two VIPs were to compare their answers and see that they weren't the same, they'd be like, oh, well, that's classy. But it, it's more than that. Um, and the, what it is is that... In having to write out an individual response for each email, what you have to do is think really carefully and thoroughly about what that person specifically has written to you. You stop scanning for keywords and going like, oh, okay, well, they had this problem. Boop, I'll send them this message next. You have to pay attention to the whole thing that they've written and make sure that you've addressed it all. And that means that you're thinking harder and more carefully about what they're actually saying to you. And that's how you get better support. Okay. Um, so another thing that you need to think about <laughs> with uh, support and, is holidays, planning for holidays. Everybody wants to go on holiday. Of course you do. We're people. We like holidays. The thing is that holidays are also a time when your um, players have taken time off from work and they want to spend time and money playing your game. So... Uh, make sure that you have a way to find out if, for example, your game goes down. This happened actually to uh, a game that we work with over the Christmas week, a couple years, uh, sometime recently. They, uh, the game went down completely, gray screen. We had a big promotion planned. We couldn't reach anybody. Nobody could play the game. We couldn't reach them. So we had to pull the promotion, and it was quite a few days before we managed to get in touch with anybody there. And, of course, then they got the game back up. But um, by then, the promotion window was over. The players had been locked out for, you know, several days. And uh, it was financially not a good time for them. So make sure that there is somebody around on holidays. 
Um, the way Congregate does it, that's our contact us form, isn't it lovely? Um, the way Congregate does it is that we are not 24 hours, but we are seven days a week. We close on Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Day, Easter, and July 4th. We work half days on Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, and Mother's Day. Every other day of the year, someone is there to answer your questions and help you. Now, I know that for many of you, that schedule would be excessive. Uh, But you should be without coverage for an entire week at a time, and you should always have a way to be notified if the game goes offline completely. Um, Occasionally, you'll run into support issues that seem simply preposterous. Nikhil, I'm about to tell a story that you are very familiar with. Imagine that in your game, the best gear is the black diamond armor, and almost nobody gets an entire set of black diamond armor. Now imagine that somebody writes into you and says that they had an entire set of black diamond armor, and it suddenly vanished. And you're thinking, lol, no. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't born yesterday, my friend. But now imagine, and this is based on a real story, that the player in question has spent $90,000 in your game. And you go, oh shit, of course he had a full set of black diamond armor. So the moral of the story is that you should investigate. Our instincts are worth listening to, but they're not the whole story. And some players are going to be outliers. So make sure you check (laughs) that something is or is not possible because if someone has spent that much money, you don't want to send them an email that goes, (laughs) sure, buddy, you have big fun with that because that's going to end real badly. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) got real quiet all of a sudden. So a lot of the things that I've been talking about, um, they sound really easy to do. All this sort of putting yourself out there in the middle of a crisis, knowing who you are, being willing to talk honestly with players about what they're experiencing, being willing to see your faults and apologize for them. And that sounds really easy, and it's not. Um, There are going to be times when you're doing this that you are going to feel really defeated, and you're going to feel really exposed. And it is going to suck. Um... And that's the nature of what we do. That people sometimes see the bricks underneath the facade. But the more you fall, the more you'll learn how to get through it and take care of yourself and get back up again. There was a time uh, last spring where I was in a situation where it appeared that we were facing a fraud problem. I reacted too quickly. Learned something new about myself that day. Uh, in part because someone near me was reacting strongly, and I allowed that to affect me. I didn't have all the facts, and I made a decision that in retrospect was clearly wrong. And I was mortified. And the worst thing about it, the single thing that was hardest, was not that I had failed, but that I had failed publicly. That every person I worked with had seen this mistake that I had made. And so I just sort of hunkered down with my laptop and tried to figure out how to get through this. And Emily, remember Emily from the first slide? She reached out to me and she said, you know what, I make mistakes. And that's part of being the CEO is that when you make a mistake, your mistake is always public. And it is always expensive. And that's a reality of leadership is that when you're leading people, you're exposed. Um, And it's not easy. But it's worthwhile. Um, When you do run into a situation where you're feeling exposed, the thing is to learn from it and to learn from it in a way that is as public and as honest as the way you made the mistake. Because that will inspire the people around you to also learn and grow in a very public way. And it will um, only increase their respect for you. So, uh, John Kennedy, when he was running for office, um, gave a series of speeches in which he claimed that the Chinese character for crisis was a combination of the uh, characters for opportunity and danger. 
And according to Professor Google, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> some sites say it's completely wrong. Some sites say it's only kind of wrong, but the point is it's wrong. Um, but it says something to me that 50 years later, this is still like a widely held, sort of commonly accepted belief in our culture. Because, and I think that's because it touches something that we all intuitively know, that when a... Um, when we're starting a crisis, that means that the status quo is no longer stable. That means that movement is happening, and in that movement is an opportunity for positive change. It's also an opportunity for negative change, but let's not worry about that too much right now. <laughs> the, the point is, there's, it, once, once you've got the rock rolling, then you're steering it, but often the hardest thing is to get the rock rolling. And so... Once you're in that crisis, try to remember that there are going to be opportunities here because you're moving, and it's not the same. So the human need to connect with others is ancient, and it's profound, and yet we live in interesting times. Technology is transforming the world around us. We haven't gone to Mars yet, but um, our world is being transformed. And I believe that we here in this room are pioneers. We are thinking about and working towards ways for people to connect with each other in a new world, in a world that nobody has ever seen or experienced or thought about before. We're trying to figure out how to bring humanity to our future. And that goal is big and it is beautiful and it's greater than we are. And in order for all of that to happen, you are going to have to be the best wisest, kindest, most competent person you can be. And the next month, you're going to have to be even better than that. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything else that I would rather do for a living. So that's all I have. Are there questions? Thank you.